Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you for joining us. Welcome to Anderson House here in Washington, D.C. My name is Andrew Alton, and I'm the Historical Programs Manager for the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati. The American Revolution Institute promotes knowledge and appreciation for the achievement of American independence, fulfilling the aim of the Continental Army officers who founded the Society of the Cincinnati in 1783 to perpetuate the memory of that vast event and to preserve the timeless ideals on which this nation was established. Those ideals such as liberty, equality, freedom, civic responsibility, natural and civil rights, and the rule of law shaped our nation's history as well as other countries worldwide and are just as important and relevant today as they were at the outset of the Revolutionary War in 1775. Along with this lecture tonight, the Institute's work includes supporting advanced study, developing changing exhibitions and other historical programs and tours, advocating for historic preservation, and providing resources to classrooms nationwide that assist teachers, students, and scholars alike. Tonight's lecture features Christopher Sabic and Sherilyn Gilligan of the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum discussing the artifacts of Arnold's Bay following the diaspora of material culture over time and is made possible in part by a generous gift provided by the Massachusetts Society of the Cincinnati. During the last engagement of 1776, of the Northern uh, Campaign of 1776, uh, General Benedict Arnold burned the remaining vessels of his American fleet in Lake Champlain to prevent capture by the British. In 2020, the National Park Service's American Battlefield Protection Program funded an archaeological survey project of this area now classified as a Revolutionary War battlefield known as Arnold's Bay. Tonight, Sherilyn Cher Gilligan and Christopher, Christopher Sabic uh, discuss their work on this recent archaeological study and shed light on new interpretations and understandings of the events that transpired, as well as more questions to investigate. Christopher Sabic is the Director of Conservation at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum. In 2013, he took the reins of the museum's archaeological research wing as their archaeological director. Chris earned his bachelor's degree in history and anthropology from Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. His master's in anthropology uh, and his master's in anthropology from the, uh, from the nautical archaeology program at Texas A&M University. His master's thesis focused on the history and construction of the War of 1812 Great Lakes Schooner Nancy, uh, 1789 to 1814. Sherilyn Gilligan is the assistant director of archaeology at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum and has been working in the field of archaeology since 2005. She earned her master's in applied archaeology from the, University, the Indiana University of Pennsylvania in 2017. Her experience includes working as a lab and field technician for several museums and cultural resource management companies, and she is listed on the Register of Professional Archaeologists. Her skill sets include conservation of archaeological materials, archival research, technical report writing, human and zoo archaeological bone identification, historic and prehistoric artifact identification, and general knowledge of GIS systems and map making abilities using ArcGIS software. Now, before I turn things over to Chris and Sherilyn, a few housekeeping items are in order for those of you tuning in with us on Zoom. Following this evening's lecture, there will be a question and answer session, so feel free to submit your questions for Chris and Sherilyn using the Q&A function found at the bottom of your screen, and we will do our best to incorporate them with our live audience questions. Should you have any technical related questions or comments, those can be submitted using the chat function, and one of our staff members will do, be monitoring that and will do their best to assist you. Uh, so without further delay, I'm going to stop talking. So please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Chris and Sher uh, Christopher Sabic and Sherilyn Gilligan. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, tonight, we're going to be talking about our recent archaeological activities in Arnold's Bay, and it's going to be basically in two, two sections. I'm going to cover kind of background history and previous archaeology, as indicated on our first slide here. And then I'll be passing the baton off to Cher, who can discuss uh, some of the things that we found, some of the questions that that's uh, have both answered and raised uh, as we continue on this research uh, opportunity that we're going to be continuing this summer. So let's just dive right in here and, uh, and we'll get going. 
Um, for those of you who are not aware, Lake Champlain is located between the states of New York and Vermont, and it extends slightly over the, bo the Canadian border into southern Quebec. Um, and it's this long, it's 122 miles long. It's about 12 miles wide at its widest point. And it's this north-south orientation that really makes it a, a very important natural corridor through the wilderness, um, particularly in the 18th century when um, this area was very undeveloped uh, for the most part. And so traveling by water was by far the most efficient and effective way to move large amounts of men and material and trade goods through this area. Um, it also, the, the lake drains to the north through the Richelieu River and into the St. Lawrence River. So there's, uh, it's, there's an all water route there, but it is uh, broken up by several series of, of rapids in the Richelieu River at the northern end of the lake. Um, at the southern end of the lake uh, ends in what's now known as Whitehall, New York, um, which is only about 45 miles from the headwaters of the Hudson River. So the combination of Lake Champlain, uh, to some extent Lake George, and then the Hudson River makes an all water corridor from the Canadian border all the way down to New York City. And again, this is why this was such a strategic uh, location during not only the uh, American Revolution, but also the earlier colonial wars, the French and Indian War, and then ultimately the War of 1812 as well control of this corridor would have effectively isolated, you know, carved off a section of the of the colonies um, with that old strategy of dividing and conquering. It was it was something that the, the British were certainly interested in doing both in the revolution and the War of 1812. Um, as we zoom in here a little bit to, to focus on Lake Champlain itself, we're going to have two main um, areas of interest that we will mention multiple times throughout these presentations. Um, the activity that we're going to be discussing really started at Valcour Bay in October of 1776 with the Battle of Valcour Bay, which was the most significant naval action to take place on Lake Champlain. Um, and uh, that, that story is going to end in what's now known as Arnold's Bay. At the time, it was known as Ferris's Bay, named after a local homesteading family that lived on the bay itself. And here we have uh, a little zoom in to show you where Arnold's Bay is located. It's in Addison County, Vermont, uh, in the town of Panton. Um, this is probably about 32, 33 miles south of Burlington, if you're familiar with Burlington. And uh, luckily for us, just a couple miles south of the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum itself. So it's literally in our right in our backyard and um, makes, it, makes it easy to do this kind of field work when it's that close to home. Um, this is a, an image of what Arnold's Bay looks like today. Um, it's not a, it's not a large bay. It's um, it, oh my bad. Let me go back here if I can. It's about three hundred uh, yards across uh, and about three hundred yards deep. Um, so not a large bay by any stretch of the imagination. It's also quite shallow. You only reach a fifteen feet of water when you get right out to the mouth of the bay, and it just gets can considerably shallower as you move into shore. And this actually turned out to be a very important um, feature for the bay and, and why it was chosen um, as the location for Arnold to abandon his fleet um, on October 13th of 1776. But before we talk about that, we should back up to the Battle of Valcour Island. And I'm not gonna go into this in great detail, but it um, is certainly important to understand uh, why these things happened in Arnold's Bay that we're going to talk about in more detail. Right throughout this, the, the summer of 1776, both the British and the Americans uh, were producing vessels for fleets to defend Lake Champlain from invasion or in hopes of invading in the case of the British. And the, the British were constructing their vessels up at St. Jean, which is just across the Canadian border uh, at the, uh, the last navigable section of the lake before you hit the rapids uh, in the Richelieu. And uh, it doesn't even make it onto this map, but the Americans were building their fleet at what was then known as Skeensboro, um, is now known as Whitehall, New York, which is way at the southern 
very southern tip of Lake Champlain. Uh, that shipbuilding effort continued throughout the summer. Um, at uh, starting midsummer, the American fleet, uh, what was constructed at that time, did start to cruise the lake, um, and it was commanded by uh, by Benedict Arnold. He took the opportunity to do a lot of scouting uh, and take a lot of depth readings at various points throughout the lake in, in hopes of identifying uh, effective places where his fleet might be able to make a stand uh, against the larger British fleet that was being constructed up at um, Fort St. Jean. And those two fleets finally did come together in combat on October 11th of 1776 at the Battle of Valcour Bay. Um, one of these positions that Arnold was able to identify was actually just behind um, Valcour Island, which is separated from the New York shore of Lake Champlain by about a mile of water. And uh, Arnold shows this location to position his fleet for one really uh, rather ingenious reason, right? The British were going to be sailing down from the north and therefore they, their vessels required a wind blowing from the north uh, to carry them up the lake. And uh, Arnold knew that in this position, his fleet wouldn't actually be observed by the British until they had sailed past the island, at which point they would have to try to turn into the wind to come to grips with the American fleet hidden behind Valcour Island, um, therefore giving the Americans uh, the weather gauge and a big advantage in any uh, naval battle in the age of sail. And this proved to be the case uh, and proved to be a very effective tactic because many of the larger vessels in the British fleet were unable to fight their way up into the wind. And they ended up uh, coming, getting stuck down a little farther south of Valcour Island and actually played a relatively small role in the battle itself. The majority of the fighting on October 11th um, on the British side was carried out by their gunboat fleet. They had uh, 28 um, single-masted, single-gun gunboats that could be rowed, so they could be rowed up into the wind. They weren't uh, reliant on sail power to get them up uh, to come to grips with the American fleet. The majority of the American fleet was either anchored or, you know, in a in a tidy little position here behind the island, and um, action started early on the morning uh, of the 11th really started to get heated around uh, 11 o'clock and into the noon hour. Things became, as Arnold mentions in his journal, uh, the, the combat became general and heated. Um, so things really started to get uh, quite interesting. Um, the battle there continued until night fell um, and the American forces definitely took a, took a bit of a pounding. Um, here we go. We have a nice painting here of the Battle of Valcour Island uh, by a local naval artist uh, in the Champlain Valley named Ernie Haas. You're going to see several of his paintings throughout my uh, presentation, my portion of the presentation today. Um, and this is a good opportunity to talk about the two main vessel types that were involved in the American fleet that are going to play a role in our discussions of Arnold's Bay. The American fleet consisted of 15 vessels, um, the majority of which were uh, of two types. They were the gunboats and the row galleys. Um, the, the gunboats are these smaller single masted vessels. This is this class of vessel that um, the Philadelphia is, which is in the Smithsonian Institute, of course. Um, and they were very easy to build. Um, even house carpenters could build these vessels. They're flat bottomed. Um, it's kind of an, an expanded bateau style. It's uh, pretty simply built. It has three guns, one pointed off the bow and then one off either side uh, in the waist of the vessel. Has a single square sail, uh, which means honestly, it, it wasn't a great sailing vessel. With a flat bottom and a single square uh, sail, it, uh, if, if the wind was not from directly astern, it had a tendency to slide sideways instead of going downwind. So they were often rowed. They had these enormous 18 foot long ash sweeps that they could use to propel the vessels. Um, 
which they unfortunately had to do quite a bit of, uh, I think at this time. Um, so they, this was the first vessel that the Americans started to build um, when they started to construct the fleet at Screensboro. Um, Arnold, when he took charge of that shipbuilding effort, realized that these, gu these gunboats were, you know, quick to build, but maybe not the most effective fighting vessels in the world. And he suggested that they start building uh, the larger row galleys, which typically carried eight guns uh, arranged in broadsides. So they were all pointing out to the sides. Uh, they are two masted vessels. They have a really interesting rig called a Latin rig, which is a fore and aft kind of sail made a, a slightly more um, maneuverable in the confined waters of Lake Champlain, slightly better sailing vessels, certainly better fighting platforms. Um, the, to give you an idea of the size, the gunboat is 54 feet long. The row galley is 75 feet long. So it's half again as big and a much more powerful vessel. Now in total, there were eight of the gunboats, but only three of the row galleys involved at the Battle of Valcour Bay. There were also a number of small, uh, other small schooners and sloops in the American fleet, most of which uh, were vessels that had existed on the lake before uh, the invasion and uh, were pressed into service uh, as military vessels as the, as the war went on. Um, and these, the, the gunboats and the row galleys are gonna play a role in uh, our discussions of Arnold's Bay in, in, in a moment. The, the fighting, as I mentioned, went on throughout the day uh, as night fell. Um, one of the American gunboats was sinking, and that's the Philadelphia, and that's the reason that it exists in the Smithsonian these days, because it sank into the cold, dark waters of Lake Champlain uh, during the evening of October 11th. Luckily, the majority of the crew was able to escape onto the row galley Washington, which we see here in the background. Uh, though you may notice that the Washington in this case has only a single mast, and that's because its foremast had been shot away during, uh, during the combat. So the American fleet certainly took a significant pounding during this battle. They had at least 50 men killed um, out of their complement, many more wounded. They were running low on gunpowder and ammunition for their, uh, for their guns. And they found themselves in a, in a very sticky situation. The British fleet uh, backed off a little way, but it's kind of set up a cordon to keep the Americans hemmed in behind Valcour Island with the idea that they would come in in the morning and finish off the, the American fleet. So being uh, contained uh, behind Valcour Island by this British blockade, which you know, this image uh, of the battle, which is contemporaneous to the battle, does kind of suggest that there was a continuous line of British vessels across this stretch of water, which is more than a mile um, from the southern tip of the island over to the New York shore. Kind of kind of gives the false impression that it was a, you know, a really stiff and um, these boats weren't weren't lined up side to side across uh, across the bay. There was definitely some gaps in the in the cord in there. So the Americans settled on a very audacious uh, method of removing themselves from this sticky situation. Um, they, in, in the middle of the night, they lined their vessels up a single file. They placed a lantern in the stern of each vessel that was shielded on three sides, so it could only be seen from directly astern. They wrapped their oars in greased rags, and they snuck through the British line and escaped uh, by following the New York shore. That's this dotted line here indicated with the red arrows and they snuck away. Now they may have been aided in this escape effort uh, to some extent by the burning of the Royal Savage. The Royal Savage is another vessel in the American fleet and one of the schooners that I mentioned that was uh, built before the war and then, and then pressed into service. It was actually a vessel that the Americans had captured from the British on their way north in the, the invasion of Canada in 1775. And it had been Benedict Arnold's flagship uh, until the Rogue Alley Congress joined his fleet. Um, and he transferred his flag from the Royal Savage to the Rogue Alley Congress. Anyway, early in the battle through some uh, poor handling of the vessel and, and quite possibly by some damage caused by British fire, 
the Royal Savage had been um, run up onto the rocks at the very southern end of Valcour Island. And uh, the Americans were forced to abandon the vessel. Uh, for a brief time, British sailors occupied the vessel and turned the guns of the Royal Savage on the American fleet. Um, when they received a lot of fire back from the American fleet, they abandoned the vessel. And in the evening, they set it afire so that it couldn't be used uh, again in the battle. So as the Americans were sneaking away, undoubtedly this extremely bright, burning, potentially exploding from time to time shipwreck on the southern tip of Valcor Island was undoubtedly a, a, a great distraction for the um, very weary British sailors that were supposed to be watching for uh, any effort to escape by the Americans. I also have to keep in mind that undoubtedly these guys were all deaf <laughs> at this point. Being near, you know, large cannons firing all day long, um, they're incredibly, incredibly loud. And I'm sure that they were all somewhat dazed just by the continual concussion of these guns going off during the day. So I would say they, should, they could be forgiven for not noticing these boats sneaking through their lines with the uh, big visual distraction of the, of the Royal Savage burning and the fact that they were certainly, um, their hearing was significantly impaired by the, by the day's events. The American fleet um, managed to sneak away and during the night, they fled south uh, about five miles to Schuyler Island where they stopped temporarily to patch holes in their vessels, uh, fix their rigging. Um, unfortunately, at this location, they were forced to abandon two of the gunboats that were sinking, um, those being the gunboats, the Jersey and the Spitfire. Uh, the Spitfire sank into deep water um, and uh, was lost until it was discovered again in 1997. <clears throat> by the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum uh, conducting a survey of Lake Champlain. Uh, the gunboat New Jersey they thought was going to sink. Uh, it apparently became swamped but didn't fully sink and the British were able to, to scoop it up the next day and uh, pump it out and use it um, uh, later uh, during their efforts on Lake Champlain. The rest of the fleet though continued to work its way south um, they were facing very contrary winds, so I think a lot of this was definitely them, them rowing. Uh, they were doing a lot of rowing, and I'm sure they were all extremely exhausted, hungry, uh, and, and traumatized by the events of the day. The British, um, you know, as dawn broke on the morning of October 12th, they realized that the Americans had escaped. And looking south, they could still see the top masts of some of the uh, American fleet, and they set off in pursuit as well. Uh, but they had the same contrary winds that the Americans were facing. So they did make up a lot of ground uh, to catch the American fleet on the day of the 12th. Um, <clears throat> the, both fleets continued to work their way south uh, during the day on the 12th. And it wasn't until the morning of October 13th that there started to be a wind out of the north. And of course, uh, coming from the north, the British were the first ones to receive that wind, and they started to make up a lot of ground on the American fleet on the morning of, of the 13th. They finally caught up with the American fleet near Split Rock Mountain, and a two and a half hour long running gun battle ensued, um, where Benedict Arnold had picked the position at, at Valcor to you know, maximize the effectiveness of his fleet. Uh, and minimize its deficiencies in this run and gun battle, uh, the roles were reversed. The British certainly had the advantage. They were much better sailing vessels. They had uh, significantly more firepower and they had better trained sailors that could do all of those things at the same time, which the uh, American fleet could, couldn't, they could, but not as effectively as the British. So the uh, American fleet was taking a significant amount of damage um, it was at this point that the row galley Washington, that one I mentioned before that had one of its masts shot away, um, was surrendered. It had fallen behind the rest of the fleet because it wasn't sailing very effectively, and the British were able to capture that vessel. Um, and uh, a, a few of the vessels of the American fleet, mostly these small uh, other schooners and sloops, 
as well as one of the row galleys had actually pulled ahead uh, of the main body of the fleet and they managed to escape. But Arnold was left with the row galley, the Congress, and four of the, the gunboats. Um, and the British were bearing down on them uh, in a big way. And he realized that he was going to lose those vessels as well if he didn't do something drastic. So he, being aware of this area and having done this scouting, having traveled through the area, he was aware of the shallow bay known as Ferris's Bay, uh, named after the local homesteading family that lived on the bay. So he chose Ferris's Bay as the place to drive these remaining five vessels onto the shoreline. Um, the, the shallowness of the bay prevented the British from following the American fleet in um, because they're much larger and vessels that drafted more water, they couldn't come in there safely uh, without fear of running aground. So Arnold was able to buy a little bit of time by pulling into the shallow bay long enough for him to uh, set those vessels on fire and escape onto shore and then ultimately escape uh, down overland to Crown Point and ultimately Fort Ticonderoga. So they pulled the vessels in, um, they left their flags flying, they set the vessels on fire, they took what they could carry with them and they escaped overland, taking the Ferris family with them. The Ferrises were uh, very well-known homesteaders in the area. They were ardent patriots, um, and they knew that the British weren't going to be really happy with them anyway. So they they went with the uh, the remaining sailors and soldiers from the American fleet and fled south. Um, the burned out hulks of these five vessels um, remained visible in in the bay for many years. Um, and have been the focus of salvaging efforts um, ever since the event happened. Uh, in the short aftermath of the battle, the British came in um, in smaller boats and were able to recover a lot of guns and other equipment from the burned out vessels that they could reuse in their fleet. Um, throughout the 19th century, we have reports of um, three of the four gunboats being pulled out of the lake by folks that were looking for, you know, usable timber. These boats were all made out of oak, you know, big thick oak beams that could be used for other purposes, uh, perhaps as historical curiosities. Um, it was, it was an easy, easily accessible source of this quality wood that they were uh, often recovering. In, in the 1890s, we know that a portion of the Row Galley Congress, the one Row Galley that was burned at this location, um, the local family uh, named the Adams, who operated a ferry uh, across Lake Champlain in this area, they recovered the stern of the Congress. Um, somehow they managed to break off about a 35 foot section of the boat and dragged it onto shore as we see in this picture. Um, where it uh, unfortunately sat and was kind of picked apart. It sounds like it, it may have traveled uh, for a while down to Chimney Point, which is where the bridge that crosses Lake Champlain is to now, uh, today, and was on display there behind a hotel for a while. And eventually it, the ma majority of it just rotted and, and, and has been lost to history. Luckily, two of the, the floors or, or frames, these the, you know what you might casually call the ribs of the boat, have survived, and those are uh, something that we're lucky to have at the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum today. Um, also, in the early 1930s, um, a you're going to talk about this in some detail. Okay, uh, someone found a four a four pound uh, cannon at the mouth of the bay, which was probably jettisoned off of one of these boats as they came into the bay. Um, we'll get a little more detail about that uh, later. Um, and then in 1952, Lorenzo Hagland, the same gentleman who found the Philadelphia at Valcour Bay and raised it, um, came to Arnold's Bay and he recovered the last of the four gunboats that was brought into Arnold's Bay. Um, he lifted it, he uh, brought it to the other side of the lake. He actually sank it there again for a while until he could figure out what to do with it. 
Um, and ultimately it was placed at the mouth of the Osable River on the New York side of the lake, um, where he had hoped to construct a, a museum um, of, of maritime relics from Lake Champlain at some point in the future. Unfortunately, this never came about. Um, you can see here, this is a picture of the, the 1952 gunboat, as we call it, um, surrounded by weeds and, and slowly rotting away. Um, ultimately, this location became the site of a KOA campground, and this boat was bulldozed and destroyed. And we have some fragments of it, but other than that, there's not a whole, whole lot left of this uh, uh, unnamed gunboat. Um, and uh, other kind of more recent archaeological activity that's taken place at uh, Arnold's Bay. I, I should mention that it was known as Ferris's Bay at the time. Obviously, after these exciting events and, and important events of the American Revolution, it quickly started to took on the name of Arnold's Bay, named after Benedict Arnold, of course, and, and it has been known uh, as such ever since. Um, in the 1980s, an effort was made to actually excavate the remains of the Ferris's homestead, which was located uh, at the mouth of a small creek on a bluff um, uh, on Arnold's Bay. That shoreline has been, uh, been receding since the time of the battle, and the, the cellar hole of the Ferris homestead was starting to fall into the lake. So archaeologists... Uh, took the opportunity to go and carry out a pretty extensive excavation of the homestead site, recovered many hundreds of really interesting artifacts that date uh, from the revolution and before right up into the early 19th century. And there's also collections that we house at the Maritime Museum and are very interesting uh, comparative sample for the work we're doing uh, these days. This work was carried out under the direction of David Starbuck, who's a very well-known uh, archaeologist of the whole kind of military corridor, Lake Champlain, Hudson River area. Um, unfortunately, recently passed during the during the pandemic. He died in, in 2020. Um, and then in 2001, the Maritime Museum uh, staff under uh, a DOD legacy program uh, spent some time in Arnold's Bay trying to relocate the 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 rest of the Congress. All right, we know that the Ferret or the Adams uh, had recovered the stern section of the vessel, um, but through some examination by Maritime Museum employees in 2001, they relocated the, the remaining forward section of the Congress. They did a, a visual examination of much of the rest of the bay as well, found a lot of scattered timbers, um, which may or may not be related to the fleet, um, but certainly were able to locate articulated attached remains of the Congress. And it may not look like much here, but this is, a, this is one of the planks of the Congress sticking out of the bottom here. And we'll actually see that again in, in just a moment. Um, so this is kind of the, you know, the, the, the research world that we, we came into this project with. Um, we, know, we know where the Ferris Homestead is. Uh, we know where the Congress remains are. And we can only assume that there is, uh, you know, a lot of other interesting material around and adjacent to this site. So that is uh, where we started going into the water last year and, and doing some more work. Um, pretty quickly, uh, we relocated that plank that was sticking out of the mud in two thousand from two thousand and one. That's it here, and you can see that it has. Uh, uh, a couple of frames or ribs uh, that are perpendicular to that plank. There's some interior planking, which would be known as ceiling planking. That's the interior hull planking of the vessel. Uh, and not only this one plank that sticks out of the mud, but there is at least two other planks uh, adjacent to it as well. So once again, we were pretty confident that this was uh, the, the remains of the forward half of the Congress. Um, Directly adjacent to these remains, we also found two large uh, piles of stone, which were very much out of place from the bottom of Arnold's Bay. The rest of it is mostly uh, silt with lots of weed growth, but we found these interesting piles of stone. And we came to learn that the, these were ballast stones from the Congress, 
which had been removed from the structure in the 1960s by a local group of avocational archaeologists who had come in and spent two years, uh, parts of two summers, excavating the interior of the Congress and recovering a lot of artifacts that we'll hear some more about in the future as well. But as they did that, they just, when they got to the ballast stones, they just threw them off to the side of the boat. And this is where they've come to rest. So they've become a, um, a good landmark for us to, to refine this, this site every year. Um, and we'll hear some more about that in the future as well. So we, you know, as we started to think about um, what we knew and what we didn't know, we started to think about where we wanted to look to try to answer the questions we had. We know where the Congress is, but we don't know where any of those other four gunboats uh, were actually burned and abandoned. We know they were burned and abandoned and later recovered, but we don't know where. And so one of the goals of our operation is, is to try to identify those, those burn locations and abandonment locations, uh, and also to examine the, the fields around the bay to determine if there was any um, concentrations of artifacts that would give us some more evidence of the flight of the Americans uh, off of these vessels and south. And that brings us to Cher's portion of the presentation where she can tell us about some of the exciting stuff that we found and, uh, and what it's telling us about the battle. Hi, thanks so much for having us here today to talk about this project. We're super excited about it. Um, so I'm gonna begin to, uh, by discussing the metal detection survey, um, our methods underwater, and I'll talk a little bit about um, some of our preliminary interpretations of that data. And then I'm gonna combine those findings with the terrestrial metal detecting survey that was conducted in partnership with the Advanced Metal Detecting for the Archeologist group. Um, and I'll go over what was found in those survey areas as well, along with some preliminary interpretations for those uh, data. And then I wanna to touch base on uh, some material culture that's found its way into our museum's collections over the years, as well as some objects that are scattered throughout the Champlain Valley and in other uh, museum collections and even private collections and discuss how that kind of material culture can add to our overall understanding and interpretation of this revolutionary battlefield site. And again, we'll have time for questions at the end. And we brought some of these materials um, with us today from the latest excavations. So we'll have a chance to see those at the end too. Okay, where's the, the laser pointer? All right, we got it. <laughs> um, so as we saw in Chris Sabick's presentation, um, Arnold's Bay is located in Panton, Vermont. Um, here on the right, you can see the bay's proximity to Valcor Island as well. Um, so getting a, a good idea of the state and uh, how far that three-day battle was. Um, and then zoomed in more on the left here, we have a picture of the bay itself, which is where the skirmish ended on October 3rd, 7, 13th, excuse me, 1776. Again, very shallow bay, 15 feet deep um, at the mouth and quickly getting shallow. You can actually see from the Google imagery how shallow it looks even um, from the aerial. So from our historic research with primary documents about the, this site, as well as our research on previous disturbance of the site over time, uh, we chose the general areas where we wanted to survey underwater. We had the coordinates again from the remains of Congress from the 2001 investigation. Um, so we were quickly able to relocate um, those remains. Um, however, as Chris mentioned uh, in the 1960s investigations, um, we did develop uh, some new material. Um, actually, <laughs> our colleague Ed Scullin in 2020 interviewed Bill Leach again, who was the man who ran the excavation project in the 1960s. Um, so we know that uh, with the use of a dredge, they excavated just the interior of the vessel. So none of the outside um, sediments around the vessel were, were really touched by him. Um, and then as is general practice, uh, they refilled the vessel once they finished excavating with soil so that it continued to preserve the, the wreck in situ. And again, for this specific project, uh, we have not excavated the remains of Congress, um, but we do have a permit application into the Navy Heritage History Command to be able to access that site, hopefully in the future. And you can see again on 
uh, the right are two underwater transects. Um, transects are what we use to keep track of the area that we're surveying underwater. So we laid out uh, straight lines north to south, about 50 feet long to start. Um, and we used a pre-measured rope tied between two cinder blocks and then used a compass underwater to get that alignment correct. Um, and then uh, we extended a tape, a tape measure line, uh, just for reference of measurement, um, and send up floats from the north and south points. Um, so we could take GPS measurements of those and get that into a map, as you can see here. Um, and then the idea is uh, you'll go and metal detect the, either the east or the west side, um, generally in your arm span, maybe a little further if you have the enough visibility to take the measurements. Um, and then on your clipboard underwater, you're writing your reference from the line and the measurement over east or west. Um, and so that way we have the actual GPS point uh, basically of where each found object was along the line. Um, Again, the yellow point on the map here is the Congress. Uh, to the west of that location, about 50 feet or so, uh, we placed our first transect. Um, again, started out 50 feet long. We started at the north end and metal detected on the west side of transect one until we started finding what appeared to be more articulated vessel remains. Again, which we could not disturb as we don't have a permit. So we terminated that transect. We didn't want to disturb anything that might be associated uh, with articulated remains of that vessel. Um, so we didn't even try to metal detect the east side. <laughs> we decided, all right, we're going to place a new transect. Um, and so we placed the second transect to the east of the remains of Congress and followed that same methodology. So metal detected the west side first, then moved to the east side. And what we decided to do was actually extend that same transect 50 feet more because at the 50 point mark to the south, we were still finding quite a lot of material. Um, so we extended that 50 more feet. Um, and then from the image on the left, you can get a feel for what a transect looks like underwater before you start stirring up too much sediment. So the underwater survey last year produced 95 artifacts. Um, you can see them broken down into categories here. Quickly see the majority of that collection is made up of diagnostic nails. Um, we've also got a section of modern or unidentifiable materials. Um, a lot of history in this area <laughs> since this particular event. Um, and we had a single piece categorized as apparel, which was a brass shoe buckle that we'll show you in a bit. And we actually have here today. Um, and then we have the second largest section is ammunition. To the right, you can see how ammunition breaks down into types, um, the majority of which were musket balls. We found 24 musket balls, six pieces of case shot, and one six pound cannonball. And I've put these four pieces of melted lead in here as well, which could represent melted ammunition. On the bottom left here, you can see that first pie chart again, just artifacts by category. As a reminder, we're starting with that big orange section of nails. Um, and then a nice visual where the diagnostic nails were found along transect one and two. You can see a big gap in transect two, almost at that halfway point where we started to extend, um, where we just didn't find nails again until the Southern point, which is a really great reminder that negative data can be just as informative as finding all of these cool artifacts. Um, so as we continue to crunch more of the data that we've gathered, we'll be able to get more granular uh, information on the types of nails found, whether they count as larger spikes or smaller nails, which would have been used in different parts of the boat's construction. And so that's something that we will analyze as part of the study, but it's currently in progress. Um, again, we have a breakdown of ammunitions here in the pie chart. Um, in the map to the right, we're seeing the scatter of case shot across the site. All six pieces of case shot were found along transect two on the right-hand side. You can see they're all clustered at the north end of that uh, transect, closer to where we know the known remains, remains of the Congress are located. And then on transect one to the left and the south end of that transect, uh, you know, before we decided to terminate that one, um, that's where the location of the six pound cannonball was pulled up. And here's a picture of our colleague Ed Skull and bringing that piece up to the boat, um, which was a really exciting day in the field for us. Okay, now we're seeing a scatter of the musket balls across the two transects, which is more of an even spread um, with maybe more of a cluster near the center of transect two. And again, we have a reference pie chart reminding us there were 24 musket balls found along the two transects in total. Um, above, you can see a size comparison of these of two of these pieces. We're still in the process of analyzing these as well. 
Um, we're using some excellent resources produced in part by uh, Joel Bowie and some of our other friends from the Advanced Metal Detecting for the Archaeologist group. Uh, Joel Bowie is also an expert on arms and uh, military from the Antiques Roadshow. So we're using some of his published research that includes the use of experimental archaeology to conduct some of our analysis on fired musket balls uh, within the Arnold's Bay collection and potentially some of our other internal collections, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, and while that particular analysis is ongoing, um, I'll just make a general note on sizing here. You can generally pick out British ammunition from colonial American ammunition. Uh, British shot is typically larger, but that only accounts for the manufacturer, right? Um, we know that colonial Americans and British soldiers during this conflict sometimes used guns and ammunitions that were taken from the opposing side. Um, the melted lead that was found on site was of particular interest, um, and it was something that we were actually hoping to find um, since the presence of melted lead could indicate the location of some of these burned vessels. Um, so we know historically these boats were all removed from the bay. So our research questions included trying to locate, again, where these boats were actually beached and then burned during this event, um, and to see if we can find that out from the archeological record. So melted lead would be a positive indication of potentially where a burned ship might've been. Um, along transect two on the right, we found four pieces of melted lead, several of which had this really distinct reformed shape. It almost looks like it ran between floorboards and reformed there. Um, and it may be hard to make out from the images on the slide here, um, but uh, we do have some of, like, of these pieces here today. So definitely come up and take a look at the end of the presentation. Um, again, you know, perhaps these were melted musket balls from the floor of a vessel that seeped into the floorboards and reformed there and eventually fell to the floor of the bay. Um, maybe from actions of folks who came along later to pull timbers from the wrecks uh, to sell or make souvenirs from. Um, we've collected a lot of tales as Chris was talking about too. Um, one of them that comes to mind is uh, a captain, a former captain of a sailing ferry who um, once, you know, steam ferries took over his route in Arnold's Bay, used to tie chains or rope to the timbers and have the steam ferry uh, yank up timbers for him. Um, so, you know, another possibility for where remains could have been scattered um, and the you know, activity in the bay since this time. Um, the other part that I'll mention here is the singular piece of apparel that we found, um, which is that boot buckle there on the bottom left. Um, and the map on the right, you can see that location is the same uh, artifact cluster in the center of transect two. All right, so we've got our messy transects with all of the material we found showing. Um, and if you remember from earlier, again, that yellow section is uh, the remains of Congress. Um, and here we're playing around with data. We're trying to figure out based on the material culture that we've found, again, the locations of where some of these boats might have been burned. Um, transect two on the right, we had that big cluster of materials at the center point. Most of the case shot there towards the north end of transect two and the melted lead personal apparel uh, again, clustered around that center point. Uh, and then of course, lack of nails moving uh, to the south. So, you know, these red, these smaller red outline um, that you can see in the center of transect two, possible location maybe of uh, one of the burning gunboats. And there again, um, the larger outline, uh, that of the Congress, uh, that larger row galley, maybe blocking and protecting a smaller gunboat while men were jumping overboard to get to shore. Again, preliminary ideas from uh, last year's artifact locations, but this is the really fun and interesting part uh, to be able to play around with different scenarios and, uh, and compare what we're seeing physically, archeologically uh, to what we found in primary and secondary accounts. And of course, uh, this work from 2021 has informed where we're going to lay our transects uh, this year, test our theories and you know, make the most of the time in the field that we have for the remainder of the year um, to answer some of these questions. Um, and then that image on the left again, uh, which we saw in Chris's presentation, this is a painting by Colonel uh, Waterhouse. It's showing an interpretation of those American soldiers under fire from the British ships at Arnold's Bay, um, scrambling out of that smaller gunboat here in the foreground and that burning uh, larger row galley in, in the back is Congress. Um, so zooming back out, uh, you can see this underwater uh, cluster again for reference. Um, we do know that the British ships were too large to actually enter the mouth of the bay. Again, only 15 feet deep um, at the max. And primary accounts are referencing uh, the two sides firing back and forth at each other. So for the AMDA class, we wanted to make sure that we 
thoroughly tested the shoreline area uh, or that transitional zone where the bluff runs down to the beach um, and the waterline. So let's see. So that transitional zone um, is outlined here in yellow. And then I want to further back, you can see the areas that we chose to sample in the agricultural field um, up on the bluff outlined in those pink sections. And we spent uh, a whole day of this three class, uh, three day class focused on the easternmost shoreline. We worked, uh, we partnered with these folks. We partnered with the Stockbridge Munsee uh, community whose ancestral lands this battlefield is on. And we opened the class uh, first to tribal members, uh, but because of travel restrictions for the tribe due to COVID, um, the, the interested people that wanted to come to this uh, class uh, didn't end up coming, understandably. Um, but we did get the Tribal Historic Preservation Officer to come out um, and take this class, which was great. Um, they were able to give our class some information on the Stockbridge Militia, who we know fought on the colonial American side of this event. And we do have uh, primary sources referencing Stockbridge Militia at the Battle of Valcor. So there's a good chance that uh, some of these folks ended up um, at Arnold's Bay later as well. Okay. All right, here's the messy concentrations that I was talking about. Got it. <laughs> um, so lots of extra noise on this, but I wanted folks to see just like the larger concentrations because next I'm gonna zoom into different areas and start pulling out um, the noise and focus on some diagnostic artifacts for this time period in this event. So this uh, AMDA survey, the terrestrial survey produced about uh, 260 objects. Um, we collected a bit more than that just to have samples of the kinds of modern garbage we were finding. Um, and also um, for the next data sets, um, I'm just gonna be working with about half of the total objects uh, that we recovered. So 123 objects in total. And again, uh, the area on the Southeastern side of the bay where it starts to curve, this was um, determined to be cut and fill. Um, which is kind of unfortunate. We were hoping to see if we could tell if uh, shot scatter was carried that far. Um, but again, you know, an important thing to note about the site, which we've now found out now that we've uh, done the survey. So uh, again, I'm gonna focus in on uh, that busy shoreline where we believe there was a heavy traffic area of soldiers leaving those beach boats. Okay, uh, general breakdown of artifacts by category again. Um, I'm lumping this data set into only three categories this time. Nails and agricultural related objects, obviously the largest category. Uh, we did cover a lot of fields in the survey. And then ammunitions followed by apparel. And I'm just gonna focus on ammunition and apparel today. Um, the study of nails, it really just requires, um, I really just wanted to capture more on, on the ships, right? And less agricultural. So the focus is really on uh, the transitional zone and less in the agricultural fields. So that aside, um, on the right, we're seeing the breakdown um, again of the ammunitions, musket balls being the largest, case shot um, second, followed by um, buckshot, those really tiny lead balls. So it's really great that students were actually able to find those in the class. Um, and then we also have a lead uh, jaws pad. Um, another breakdown of, of the apparel here, um, same artifacts by category on the left. So we had seven pieces of apparel. Um, and I'll mention that as we continue to go through and refine our data and complete some of these analyses, um, these figures are likely to change. Um, I threw one of our mystery objects in here, um, but again, that's a presently unidentified piece. Um, we found some buttons here, a few buckles, a really nice example of a bayonet scabbard hook, and then that mystery object, which we'll see uh, in a few slides. Okay, so uh, trying to get the best coverage that we could um, on that, that shoreline, we were following the contours of the waterline up to where there's that sharp incline of the bluff. Lake waters are typically lower in the fall, so we were actually lucky in a way that our field work ended up getting pushed back uh, because the water level was so low that we got further into the transitional zone than we expected to. Um, and so we were able to cover a lot more ground. Um, I know this is still a pretty big, busy map, but uh, if you can see the yellow in the field and the shoreline, those, those are nails, red units are ammunitions. Um, and then we have our pie chart again showing the breakdown. Darker red points on the map, if you can make those out from where you are, um, are musket balls, the lighter ones are case shot. Um, and I've put some images showing the size difference of the ammunitions. 
um, on the bottom here. So in the very bottom, starting from the left, there's those tiny buckshots. Um, then we have the smaller, um, you know, uh, Fowler ball really like associated with colonial Americans and then the larger British shot. Um, above that, we've got iron case shot. Again, a little bit of size difference there. And then at the top, we have our lead jaws pad, um, which uh, is a really cool piece. Um, it would have wrapped around the flint and held in place um, for the hammer to strike on a, on a musket. Um, and then we have the green units on the map here, uh, which are apparel, which we're gonna look at next. A um, few buttons that we found out here, one along the shoreline. Uh, you can see one of the an example in the top here, sort of folded over. Um, another one over at the homestead, which I'll show you later. We had a buckle found on the north end of the beach and another further south. Um, there's an example of one of those fragments underneath the button. And then the two bottom images, we have that uh, top and side view of that bayonet scabbard hook that was found um, just a little further north of the cluster along the shoreline. Um, and now we're gonna check out uh, our mystery object that was over by the homestead area. Um, so this was the last survey area for the uh, terrestrial survey. Um, it was found in the field behind the Ferris homestead. Again, we had a bunch of diagnostic nails back here, probably associated with the homestead. Um, those are in the yellow markers. Ammunitions as well. There were three pieces of case shot back here in the bright red. Um, that darker red was a musket ball. Um, and then the two pieces in green are the apparel. One was the button and one was this mystery object. Um, and again, we're really not sure what this is. Um, it's an interesting thing. It's, uh, it appears cuprous. It has a bit of a green patina on parts. It's pretty heavy. Um, and we are doing some, and hopefully continue to do a little more research with the Stockbridge Muncie Tippo, um, as they were really interested in this piece. Um, and so we're wondering if this has potential to be, um, uh, have a tribal affiliation. Um, we've been trying to crowdsource information about the piece as well through the archeology archaeological community. So if anyone has research that can back up what you think this is, we'd love to hear it. Um, and then real quick, just some photos of the homestead site uh, and what it looked like during the last excavations that happened here in 1988. See those on the left. Um, that first image kind of gives you an idea of how high the bluff is at that point. Um, it's a little shallower on the eastern edge where people could actually scramble up a little easier than uh, where the actual homestead was on this side. Um, so I wanted to give folks a view of that. And then what the excavations actually looked like, they were really close to the edge there as the whole homestead site is really falling uh, down onto the beach. Um, and then on the far right here is what it looks like today. Um, we actually traced back um, the markers and found some original markers from the 88 excavations. They had left their pins in the ground uh, with some flags too. Sharpie remained on some of them. So we were able to actually plug their chart into our GIS. Um, for this site, which is really cool. Um, and let's see. So one of the last things I wanted to touch on today too was the material culture uh, from this site that's made its way to the museum as well as other museums and historical societies around the area um, through means other than our present day archeological investigations. Um, but first I wanna mention our archeological collections that we house. Uh, so you have some idea of what we have and what we've been working with internally. Um, we know that so much has happened since the time of deposition. Uh, people have been removing objects from the site, starting with the British salvage efforts right after the battle, to local relic hunters and, uh, you know, who took timbers to make souvenirs with. Um, and we know that practice continued for a really long time. Um, so over time, pieces that were historically taken from these sites um, are still slowly finding their way from local uh, private collections in the Champlain Valley to museums like ours. And sometimes these pieces these are pieces that we can really learn uh, new things from about these past events. So some of our in-house uh, archeological collections, and then I'll move on to some more of the piecemeal objects that we have, that have come to us individually. Um, so in 1952, uh, that last remaining gunboat that was pulled out of Arnold's Bay uh, that Chris spoke about, uh, we have some primary documentation on the removal of that gunboat from the Barenko collection in Lake Champlain Maritime Museum archives. Um, that includes some photographs and negatives as well as Barranco's uh, personal research, some of which includes primary documents from Lorenzo Haglund's work. Um, and then in the 1960s, uh, the underwater excavations that produced um, a sizable assemblage from Congress, um, most of which eventually came to the museum um, as part of the Liege collection. 
Um, and again, our research associate Ed Scotland recently interviewed Bill Leach and had the opportunity to ask him a bunch of clarifying questions about his work there. Um, Bill Leach is an excellent storyteller and a wealth of information. So the interview is really fabulous to listen to. Um, and again, uh, to have that in addition to this awesome artifact assemblage uh, from the 1960s there, just really a treat. Um, and then we have the museum's Ferris Homestead collection uh, from the 1988 excavations of the cellar of the homestead. Um, and that's, again, these photos here. Um, a small amount of material associated with uh, this investigation was believed to be from an underwater setting, but that wasn't the main feature of the study. Um, so we do have some odds and ends that were uh, taken from the bay as well. Um, and then, of course, we have the Valcor Bay Research Project material, an incredible study spearheaded by a research associate, Edwin Scollin. He ran that project from 1999 to 2008. Um, and that included an underwater metal detection survey of the American line from the battle um, and also a magnetometer survey. So for that study, they encountered uh, 239 artifacts, not all of which were recovered, but those materials that were, were conserved um, at the museum in our house there as well. So another goal of this project has been to pull all of this information together from our bits of internal collections and then our knowledge about existing local and sometimes not so local uh, pieces of history of this story and consolidate that knowledge that we've collected and make that data available to the interested public and other researchers, which is all of you. Um, and so I'm gonna end with some highlighted bits uh, that sort of showcase um, objects that came to the museum in more of a piecemeal fashion um, and some that reside in other areas around the Champlain Valley. <laughs> Here's that same cannon that Chris had referenced earlier. Um, again, this was found at the mouth of Arnold's Bay in the 1930s by Paul Bill Huber. He used a homemade hard hat diving helmet, uh, which sounds terrifying to me. Um, he actually had his wife pumping air to him from the surface uh, when he recovered this. Um, the cannon sat on his lawn for quite a while. Um, that's that photo on the left from the newspaper article. And it eventually found its way to the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum and was conserved there. Um, it's on display under the in the Key to Liberty exhibit building on our campus. Um, and the newspapers did quite a job sensationalizing this story and creating a lot of local interest in the remaining material culture at this site, which probably encouraged, unfortunately, a lot of other people to go and, and look for material culture from this site. Um, here, uh, again, we saw this picture earlier too, but you can see... Um, the remains of Congress that were pulled on shore here and this uh, sail ferry that's really cool behind it. Um, and again, having pictures like these helped us determine other areas along that transitional zone uh, where we really wanted to focus our metal detection uh, survey to capture what would have fallen off of these timbers over time. Um, you can see some pretty big bolts that came off of this wreck um, here at the bottom. Um, these were eventually gifted to the museum by the Haglin family. Um, and again, uh, Lorenzo Hagland was the man who raised the uh, Royal Savage in 1934 and Philadelphia in 1935. Um, so obviously he had an interest in uh, the remaining chunk of the rogue alley that was known to be in Arnold's Bay. Um, I don't think we know exactly uh, what year he began poking around in Arnold's Bay, uh, but obviously uh, we know he was involved in removing that last gunboat um, from the bay in 1952. Um, on the far left, uh, this is a really cool piece it is not housed at the museum, it's at the uh, Henry Sheldon Museum. It is his memorial chair, it was built in 1884. Uh, the third spindle from the left on the bottom row is from Congress. And other parts of this chair are actually made from other local relics around the Champlain Valley. It's a really cool piece. Um, then we have a plank and a cane from the Vermont Historical Society collection in Barrie, Vermont, um, over here. The cane is said to be made from wood from the keel of Congress. Um, and we have a lot of other items uh, in the museum collection that are these like single souvenir objects like these, like canes and wooden spoons. Um, and we know a lot of other smaller souvenir objects like these around Vermont and New York that are on display in historical societies. It include rulers, uh, gavels, and like a lot of just chunks of wood. Uh, Clinton County Historical Association in uh, Peru on the New York side, close to Plattsburgh, um, has a bunch of things like that as well. Um, this is an incredible piece. Um, just last year, a local family donated to us two windows from the Rogue Alley Congress, uh, which one of which includes the glass pane here, uh, which is about an inch thick. Uh, the second example is the frame only. 
we had no idea these still existed in some form. Um, so this was really exciting for a number of reasons. One is that we can see some of the construction techniques uh, for the windows of a rogue alley, um, including wooden fasteners that hold the joints of wood together at the corners and iron nails that you can see protruding from the sides to hold the window panes in place. Um, there are no surviving rogue alley vessels uh, from this time period. So we really don't know much about the construction overall. Um, so it's really incredible to be able to see some of these details. And secondly, how cool is it that we get to look through a window from an American flagship from the Revolutionary War, one that, you know, Benedict Arnold and his crews probably looked through during these events, and it still survives today. Um, can you play on the laptop the video? I don't want to slide through this. I'm not sure if it will do the thing. <laughs> Does it play? No. Did yours not either? Oh, darn. Okay, well, let's see if the laser pointer does it. I don't know. Well, thank you. <laughs> so last summer we had a really talented photogrammetry intern join us from ECU, Taylor Picard. And they produced some really excellent uh, 3D models of some of the pieces from our collection. And from their work, we now have 3D models of the two timbers that we have from Congress, um, which again were um, gifted to the museum by the Haglin family. Um, and those are both currently on display at the museum as well, but really awesome to have that as a resource and something that we can share with folks too who are uh, doing research about the same kind of vessels. Um, all right, so again, I had mentioned uh, Bill Liege and the Liege collection um, and the new interview that we have um, with him talking about some of uh, his methodology in the field in the 60s and also a little bit about individual objects. So I wanted to show a few slides of just some of the material uh, from his donated collections that we have um, from his work in Arnold's Bay. Uh, we have a total of 318 objects from his collection uh, with Arnold's Bay provenience. Um, and is that less than a quarter of the, how, how much of that collection would you say? Because I don't remember how much. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So it's a, it's a tiny percentage, but it's it's a good chunk of material culture that we have that we know um, is actually from Congress. Um, so again, uh, so all right, we're seeing the auger here on the left. Uh, this would have been used to help with repairs. Um, same with the beautiful ads that you see on the right, that large piece, um, and a cold chisel next to that that would have been used for cutting and shaping uh, larger nails, like the example on the far right. Um, here we have an example of ex unexploded shell. Um, there were several pieces like this in the collection, so these are just two, um, and just shows different uh, angles so you can kind of get an idea of how thick the walls of these were. Um, these were hollow cast iron spheres. They would have been filled with gunpowder, um, and then they had wooden fuses that would be cut to the right length so that they would explode at the right time after they were fired. Um, these would have been shot out of a howitzer or mortar. Um, and we know that some of the British boats carried this technology, but none of the American vessels did. Um, and so now from this collection, we know that Congress was hit by exploding shells during this battle, which is really incredible <laughs> to learn. Um, we just looked up which boats those would have been from, correct? Yeah, we were confident these are eight-inch howitzer shells, pretty good size ball. There were only two vessels in the British fleet that carried uh, Eight-inch howitzers. Those were the these, sure. Oh, thanks. <laughs> these are fragments of an eight-inch howitzer shell, and we know that the uh, only two vessels in the British fleet, two of the smaller gunboats, carried howitzers of that size, and those were the Firebrand and the Tartar, um, and they were positioned on either end of the British line and uh, were lobbing these large shells at the American fleet. And apparently one of them at least hit the, uh, the Royal Galley Congress. Thank you. Um, we also have some examples of glass bottles from inside Congress. Um, these were pieced back together from pretty tiny fragments. You can see they're kind of glued together. Um, that leftmost example, perhaps a medicine vial. Um, the, the other ones maybe a little more unclear of what exactly those were. Um, but it's all green glass pictured here. Um, and then on the right, we have some cupreous objects. That leftmost piece, um, that was the handle of the, yeah, of the sword. It's a hand guard. Hand guard from a small sword. sword. From a small sword. Um, 
We also have uh, the two examples of bayonet scabbard hooks, like the one that we found from the AMDIS survey. Um, and then on the right, um, part of a trigger guard for a musket. So with each of the objects that, like these that have found their way to the museum or other collections that we've had access to, we're learning just a little bit more about the events that took place on the day of the battle. You know, maybe what people had on their person or lost while they were finding cover. Um, and we're gathering information about what happened to the site right after the battle as well. Um, sometimes what the site looked like while boats were on display on shore or what the scenery looked like when the last uh, gunboat was taken out in 1952. Um, so by putting all these little pieces of information together, we're gaining a greater understanding of the overall picture and the overall site that we're working with. Um, we have a little bit of time left on this project and we'll be getting back in the water um, Monday, if weather permits, um, to lay some more underwater transects. Um, and maybe in the future, uh, we'll be able to look at those uh, remains of Congress as well in the surrounding area. Um, so lots to look forward to for the future in Arnold's Bay. Um, we encourage all of you to check back with us for updates uh, to the project. Um, and thank you again to uh, Andrew Outen and your colleagues at the American Revolution Institute and of the Society of the Cincinnati. We're so happy to come out and share this exciting project with all of you. Um, so stay tuned to our Goofy Dive team. Um, <laughs> and uh, stay tuned for um, updates this field season. We can't wait to bring you more. Um, I guess we'll take some questions now. Um, and then we can invite folks up to see some of the artifacts in person. Thank you. Uh, gr a great presentation, really enjoyed it. Uh, um, I know that there are some historians, I guess on the British side, that said that uh, um, Arnold left a wounded soldiers on the uh, his ships before they were blown up by the or set on fire by the Americans. Have you found any human remains as part of your archaeological survey to kind of put that to bed? <laughs> that's a great question. Um, of course, that's always a concern when we're in the field. Um, because of the nature of the surveys that we're doing, it is metal detecting. Um, we're paying attention to any associated artifacts in situ if we can, um, but we're generally just searching for metal pieces. So during this survey, uh, no, we did not encounter any human remains. Um, but there's also always a possibility of finding things later in uh, archaeological collections. Like we are re inventorying several of our collections that um, are from this area so that we can have a better catalog of things um, that are just from Arnold's Bay. So, um, you know, sometimes that's found in, in collections that are, um, are even given or, you know, um, from other institutions. So, great question. Um, we do have, I mean, there's primary sources on and accounts from both sides of that actual debate. If you want to come up here too, Chris. Yeah, well, I've please. got my own microphone. Oh. So. Oh. <laughs> um, right there's there's this account of uh, you know of one of as as one of the vessels exploded, the, a body was actually thrown up into the air and was was noticed, and um, and that's where the British came to the assumption that that Arnold had abandoned all his his wounded on the vessels as they fled ashore, and it, you know. The, the telling uh, from the American side is that this is this was one individual that was forgotten on the boat and that was uh, was probably dead or or nearly dead at the time and that Arnold when Arnold learned that this person had been left behind he became irate with the uh, the sailors that had failed to remove this individual from the vessel um, and so it, it does not appear that it was a systematic uh, process of, of abandoning the wounded on the site, um, but it was good propaganda for the British to say so. So that's that's kind of our take. There is, uh, as Cher mentioned, always the possibility that we were encounter human remains during this process, and that's one thing we're keeping an eye out for, but our current methodology is not uh, likely to encounter um, any, any bone remains just because we are principally using metal detecting as our survey technique at this time. Any other questions? <laughs> there we go. Okay, perfect. Um, 
So we had one question. Um, do, do you have any um, recommended reading materials on Valcor Bay or Arnold Bay? Did you, yes. <laughs> um, Russ Bellico's books are always a great start. Uh, Dense footnotes, excellent resource. Um, can you remember the title of the specific? Yeah, principally the his, his uh, book by Russell Bellico called "Sail and Steam in the Mountains." Uh, it's the military and commercial history of Lake Champlain and Lake George, um, which, uh, as the title suggests, covers not only the military period of lakes history but also has a great amount of information about the commercial um, part of the lakes history, which uh, also have produced hundreds of shipwrecks on the bottom of Lake Champlain. Uh, that is a fantastic. There is, uh, are a number of books that are specific to uh, some of the vessels that participated in this action. Um, we have the several uh, volumes about the Philadelphia itself, of course, since it was recovered and uh, is on display at the Smithsonian, specifically the gunboat Philadelphia by John Bratton, um, which was his, uh, dissertation uh, work that he did while he was a, a graduate student at Texas A&M University. Um, we have a number of technical reports that we've produced about the uh, archeological examination of the Valcor Bay battlefield site, um, which can be found through our website at lcmm.org. Um, so there's a lot, of, a lot of great resources out there uh, that just take a little bit of looking. Excellent. Um... You talked a little bit about the primary source material. Uh, was there like an aha source for you guys to go off of, or was it more of just you know piecing things together and you know solving the puzzle that way? Yeah, there's there's actually quite you know this is uh, this whole event we have uh, a lot of different primary source material from a lot of different viewpoints, which is really you know not always the case. <laughs> Of course, we have the, the somewhat jaundiced views of both the, uh, the British military commanders on scene, as well as the, uh, you know, Benedict Arnold's own interpretation of what he experienced and, and saw. We also have uh, the recollections of Squire Ferris, the son of uh, Peter Ferris, who witnessed these events at Arnold's Bay as a young child and later recounted those events um, uh, in his old age. Um, so, uh, you it's, know, it's really cool to take all of those perspectives too, and really apply that to what we're seeing archaeologically, right? Yes. So, I guess I would argue for the latter as like, you know, bringing everything in, all of these little bits and pieces of information, and and trying to sort of solve the puzzle a little more, absolutely, um, with each survey and each new like scientific <laughs> lens that you can put on there. Yeah, archaeology um, has the ability to, you know, either reinforce our understanding from primary uh, historic resources, refute those resources, or to clarify, and sometimes all of the above at the same time. So, um, you know, our, the archaeological data is its own primary source uh, to some extent, and uh, it's the combination of all those things that really helps to give us a better understanding of what actually happened at that time. Great, thank you. Um, we have one question about primary source material from Benedict Arnold himself. Was there any mention um, of Ar Ar Arnold's Bay that you guys went off of or um, was there, you know, yeah, at he, least something he wrote, there? He wrote basically after action reports, you know, when he was reporting on what happened afterwards. And uh, the, the easiest way to access all of that material are in the bound volumes, the, uh, the records of the American, the naval, naval records of the American Revolution, um, of which I think there's 12 or 13 it's volumes. Um, yeah. You know, I forget which volume it is that specifically covers uh, the actions on Lake Champlain, but that's that's the easiestly, uh, most easily accessible uh, source of, of of Benedict's own recollections of what happened. Now, um, we had somebody ask about the, uh, the transepts, um, how far on either side um, did the of the transepts did the underwater discovery go? All, all artifacts seem to have been collected uh, right along the transepts. Are you guys going to extend that out next time, or is there something that you're hoping to hit um, more than? We continue. Sorry. No, no, no. Go, yeah. <laughs> um, Are you going to go left, right? You know, which yeah, which way yeah, do you go? Pretty, you want to have a pretty standard methodology, right? So that you're doing the same thing no matter where you're testing. So. 
you know, again, like it, it was really based uh, for me on, on at least on my arm span and my ability to see um, that measurement and how, you know, also picture there's an extension on my arm, <laughs> which is the metal detector, right? So, um, you know, it, it is like a swath that could be a little bit different on each side, but uh, we are doing several sweeps of that um, to try and get the best coverage of that zone. So yeah, not down to centimeters here because we are underwater and we're working with gloves and we have a lot of gear on, um, but that's a great question. Um, did I catch all of that? I, I Yeah, I think, and, you know, what we, you're you're able to measure your distance along the transect by the baseline and then you measure you do an offset and yeah measure out to where you line. found your your target and we're typically working as Sharon mentioned within an arm span of our transect line so maybe six feet total um and instead of uh, extending that further we will simply establish another transect parallel to the first one you know, say 25 or 50 feet apart. Um, and we will probably have those all overlap so that if we, you know, where we found this melted lead and we have some suspicion that that might be where one of the gunboats was burned, if we uh, do another transect parallel to transect two and we find similar uh, data, similar artifacts, at, at, a, at a distance, same distance along that transect, then we can start to get an idea that there was something linear happening here, we might run a transect perpendicular yeah. at that point and see if it goes right through a concentration of this material. So that's the kind of discussions we're gonna be having going into our dive work uh, in the very near future as to where to lay those next transects. Do we have any more questions or should we turn it back to you, Andrew? Sure. All right, uh, one last round of applause for uh, Sherilyn and Chris. Apologies uh, for that last question for the folks on Zoom. Uh, Chris's uh, wireless mic actually ran out of juice there and on the last question. So I uh, do apologize for that uh, technical difficulty. Uh, but thank you both again for being here. We really do appreciate it um, for that fascinating presentation. I think we all have a better appreciation for the work that goes into all this. So um, I would invite everybody to come up here and see the artifacts on the table after you are uh, after we wrap up here. Uh, but before we do that, um, as always, I would like to uh, invite you to visit our events page on our website, AmericanRevolutionInstitute.org uh, slash events, where you can learn more and register for our upcoming historical programs. Our next historical program uh, is a lecture here at Anderson House next Thursday, August 4th at 6.30 p.m., where we will basically be pulling a full 180 and heading south for another archaeological discussion uh, with Dr. Stephen Smith of the University of South Carolina. Uh, Dr. Smith will discuss his, uh, his uh, 20 years of archaeological research and findings surrounding the Revolutionary War Southern Campaign uh, with a particular focus on the activities of uh, partisan leader Francis Marion. Uh, so he'll... Um, Dr. Smith will go into uh, Marion Snow's Island Camp, the Siege of Fort Mott, and the Battle of uh, Parker's Ferry. So uh, registration is currently open for that, as, as, well, uh, as well as all of our other future historical programs. Um, so with that, uh, on behalf of the American Revolution Institute of the Society of the Cincinnati, I would like to thank you all for coming out tonight and for tuning in with us at home or wherever you may be, and as always, for your continued support of our mission. So wish you all a great evening. Thank you both again, and until next time, good night.